Okay, welcome everyone for coming. Uh, early Friday morning. Always very difficult, of course. Um, so today I would like to show you actually a really, really cute topic. But before we can get there, we kind of want to finish the story um, that I started uh, yesterday. So remember that this is absolutely fabulous. For so your favorite formula after this class has to be some Euler characteristic formula because we see that in like a trillion different incarnations. And we saw it um, last time in this little theorem that whenever you draw a graph, uh, like nicely drawing a graph here, something like this um, in the plane, then you can always kind of uh, have, you have a nice relationship between the number of vertices, the number of edges, and the number of faces. Uh, they're always kind of alternating the sum up to two. And this was because we could think of them as kind of living on the sphere. So it's kind of a, a polygon decomposition of the sphere. So every not completely silly planar graph, uh, so case one is a little bit the, the type of silly part, every not, not silly one, like the one below, gives you actually a, a polygon decomposition of the sphere. Okay. And you can always just count, and it always works. So here we have one, two, three, four, count the outside one, five. So this guy here is five, uh, and the number of vertices is one, two, three, four, five, six. So the number of vertices is six, and now I don't need to compute the number of edges anymore. I can just solve uh, for that equation. So I have 11, two equals 11 minus whatever I need. So I guess if I'm not miscalculating, then the number of edges should be nine. Fine. Okay, absolutely amazing theorem. Um, can we use that in some way? So let's see what we can do with this. And it's actually quite amazing what, what kind of applications this kind of little theorem already has. So let's have a look. Okay, so I, I stated that in whatever, the second or third lecture, I already forgot, that this funny graph here is not planar. Um, and if you play around with it and try to draw it without self-intersections, you can somehow convince yourself that it's not. But writing down a formal proof was beyond us. Um, we were not able to do that, uh, but here's one. So we can actually do, prove it, and you will see that it's kind of, it's almost planar. If you play around with the graph a little bit, try to rearrange the edges, you somehow, it's almost planar. You almost get there, but not quite. And we'll actually see that in, in, the, in the proof. Um, and it essentially works as follows. We use the fabulous equation. Yeah. So we just use this funny guy here. And it's kind of always the same pattern. So let me do it once slowly, and then it kind of, I have like a few more applications of the same formula, and it always runs kind of the same strategy. So eventually I will ask in a tutorial, just, just do it once yourself, because it's kind of always the same, the same game. Okay, so let's assume it is. Let's assume we have found a planar drawing, and there's a certain number of faces. Well, let's call it a certain number of faces, F. The vertices and the number of edges are, of course, given. They're just staring at us. And if I'm not miscalculated, I clearly see five vertices. And if I haven't miscalculated, then there should be uh, 10 edges. So we know that the number of faces by magic formula should be seven, right? Uh -huh. Two must be number of vertices uh, minus number of edges plus number of faces. So we just solve for the number of faces. Um, and we get seven. Okay. There's a different way of doing the count, and that gives a contradiction in the end, as you can already see um, downstairs. And it's using the face degree equation. Okay, fine. So the first part, just assume it's planar, use the magic formula, you get some number for f. And this is independent of what you try, so every drawing that would be planar would, be, would give f equal seven. Okay, um, but if you just write it down differently, then you could do the following. And the faces in your wannabe planar drawing would correspond to cycles in K5. And if you look at the graph, then every face has at least three edges. You can see that here. So here's a cycle, for example. One, two, three. So this would be a face in the planar graph. And you can't do better. So every non-trivial cycle here will have at least three edges. I could do another one. Um, so here's another one, for example, two, one, something like this. So there are a lot of triangles in this picture, actually. They're just somehow hidden because it, it, it's kind of not planar. But if it would be planar, then we would find those, those triangles. So we can just solve 
um, for, or try to solve this equation, 2 times e must be the sum of the phase degrees. And it must be bigger than 3f because every phase has three edges. So that's where the 3 comes in. And then you just, well, have an equation. 2e is bigger than 3f. Okay, e is 10, fine. So 2e is definitely 20. And f is 7, well, okay. So 3f is certainly 21. And we can kind of see that this doesn't work out. 20 is certainly not bigger than 21, but it's kind of barely a little bit, a little bit uh, smaller. So this graph is not planar. Okay, so we used the previous established formulas to show that this is graph not, is not planar by assuming it is. Use the counts, and the counts don't work out. Okay, that's a really cool way of doing it. And you can kind of see, right, just compared to, you tried to do it two weeks ago, it's like, it seems impossible to prove kind of formally that it is um, not planar. So it's actually pretty cool. And, and note that it's kind of a one of, it's almost planar because this inequality is like, it's not true, obviously, but it's not very far away from being true. If you play that with different graphs, with really large, complicated looking graphs, then usually you get the inequality of this form as well, um, but the, the left number will be much smaller than the right number. So this is kind of a witness for non-planarity. It's kind of almost planar, and we'll have a more formal statement in a second. Our strategy is kind of clear. So we use the formulas that we have established and find a contradiction in the numbers that those formulas would give. Okay. Kind of not, not super difficult. It's a little bit tricky, but if you read it carefully, it's, it's not really difficult. Mm -hmm. To come up with it yourself is a different question, and I, I'm not, not assuming that anyone can come up with this as like kind of a brilliant thing to do. But in the end, if you have seen it already, it's not so difficult. It's kind of amazing huh? so that we can actually prove this um, so easily. So this one is now easy, okay? Let's do it. So it's planar if and only if. That's exactly the statement I had, whatever, two weeks ago or so. If and only if, well, n is not too big. And n is not too big is n is between one and four. So five was the one from the previous slide. All right, how do we do that? If we believe this statement, so let's believe it, um, that's actually not so difficult, so let's try. So, the K5 sits in Kn for all biggers, so the other ones can't be planar, because if you now could find a planar drawing of K6, then you would have found a planar drawing of K5 as well, because it sits in K6. Fine, so the, the, the previous uh, proposition just kills all those cases, and we have done the other ones. So I've sh well, we can do it. So here's K1, not very exciting. Here's K2, here's K3, and K4 is a bit trickier, but not that much. Here's K4. So there you go. Four planar drawings for them, so we are, we are done. Right? So the main meat here is to rule out the higher ones, and that's done by K5. As I said, K5 is kind of a witness for uh, non-planarity of graphs. I hope that makes some sense. So you can do everything, and if you do the same equation from before, for those guys, you will see that the equation works out. So it's, it's not 20 is smaller than 20, 21, but something like, I forgot what it is, but something like 15 is smaller than 20 or something. So it will work out. And this is kind of the border case where it kind of explodes and doesn't quite work out. I hope that makes some sense. Very efficient way. And this is really the same argument, but I leave that one to you. So assume that it's planar, write, write down the same type of argument, come to a contradiction. Okay. So let's, let's just take it for now, just, just assume that it's true. So if we have two planar, non planar graphs, K5 and uh, K33. So this is the fun problem if you try to do it, trying to connect three amenities to three households, and you will see that it doesn't work without intersecting edges. And again, for this one, the equation that goes wrong in the end is kind of almost true. So it's again some kind of a witness for uh, non-planarity. Okay, it turns out it's a really good witness, actually. Um, you, you're allowed to pr use this, of course, because I'm stating it. Whatever I state, you're allowed to use it. And it's a really good one. So you can check 
planarity for an arbitrary graph by just looking for k5 and k33. They're really the witnesses for that problem. Turns out you only need to know those two. And the proof is rather difficult, so we're not going to do it. Um, but it's a really good statement. So if you have a graph and it looks really complicated, um, there's always an algorithm to do it. And this algorithm is very, very fast. So if you would put it in a machine, a machine can tell you very, very quickly whether a graph is planar or not, because it will just look for subdivisions. Remember, we had a subdivisions of those two, and that's it. So you have two witnesses for the problem. And you can always tell whether a graph is planar or not. And essentially, that follows from the Euler characteristic theorem I showed you. And this is like an, uh, I mean, it's, it's a really amazing statement. If you just think of, if you just, I give you some graph and I ask, is, is it planar? Um, I would have no idea what to do. Right? But here's an, essentially an algorithm to do it, and it's not that difficult. It, it only needs, you only need to check for two, uh, for two graphs, essentially. Okay. It's really fantastic. It essentially just follows from the Euler characteristic formula. To just show you again how fantastic that, that simple looking formula actually is. It's just simple and powerful, which is like, which is like absolutely amazing. You rarely have something that is simple and powerful at the same time. Usually what you see is very complicated statements that are very powerful or very easy statements that are very boring. Right? So, but, but something that is simple and powerful is just a, a, a extremely remarkable. I hope that is clear. So essentially we have now an algorithm to decide planarity if you want. And this one is really fast. So as I said, if, if you put that in a machine, if you ask a computer, so every reasonable computer algebra system should have something like an is planar that you can just run on a graph. It will run this algorithm that comes from, from the theorem, and it will, will tell you in a second yes or no. It's kind of really, really remarkable. Again, because the problem itself looks like not that trivial, but it turns out it is. It is not so difficult. Always a remarkable uh, fact. I show you one more application. Uh, application of the Euler formula. So I'm stressing the Euler formula so much. You, you please try to remember the, the Euler formula. It's like a really important. Okay, a platonic solid. I'll show you a platonic solid in a second. Is a polygonal decomposition of a sphere constructed from regular n-gons. So you're not using um, triangles and squares and pentagons, you're just using, for example, regular pentagons or regular whatever uh, triangles. And that's a condition on a, on a platonic solid, and the Greeks like to ask the question like, they, they like polygons, so they wanted to find how many platonic solids are there actually. Um, like more than 2,000 years ago, people were already wondering about how many of those figures there are. Um, and as you might have seen, there are exactly five. And I will show you a proof today that there are exactly five. They are not anything more. And the five well-known ones are, well, like the dices. So if you play dice games, you know those very well. A four-sided dice, um, a six-sided dice, an eight-sided dice, a 12-sided dice, and the, tw the famous 20-sided dice. And they have those funny names. Um, so like Greek-sounding names, except the cube. The, the, the cube has another Greek-sounding name. Anyway, so here you have. Uh, number of vertices, number of edges, number of faces, and remember that there was some funny duality going on which does this and uh, this. Yeah. And this guy is self-dual, so it does this. Okay. Right? Well, that was the duality from last time. And this is really ill-connected. I don't want to connect four. Let me try this one again. Um, I want to connect 8 to 8 and 6 to 6. Maybe. OK. A kind of a well-known construction. And the old Greeks, more than 2,000 years ago, they came up with a solution, which is not quite the one I'm showing you. It's the, the, their solution is a bit more complicated. Um, why these are all? And I'm showing you now an Euler characteristic proof that these are all. So you can use the Euler characteristic formula as a simple-looking formula to rule out that there are any other platonic solids. So we have done like uh, our good share of 2,000 years of mathematics. Very good. In, a, in one formula. So again, the formula is just absolutely fantastic. Good. Right, so that's the question. Are there any others? Did the Gre old Greeks miss any platonic solids? Um, are we lucky? Will we find any? Uh, answer is, of course, not. 
But anyway, uh, can we understand them as polygonal decomposition of the sphere? Well, yes, they are. They are all spheres. They're just polygons on the sphere. And this is exactly why the Euler characteristic formula will apply. All right. So let's assume we have one of those, and we want to say um, that we only have platonic solids, and there's nothing else. Cool. So regular n guns. And there are V faces, E edges, and F faces. V vertices, obviously. E edges and F uh, faces. And the regularity assumption means that every vertex has a, has a fixed degree. Everything has the same. It's a regular. And every face has the same degree as well. So every face is an n gun, and every vertex is connected via P edges. These are just two extra numbers. Okay. So we have all of these numbers, F, E, sorry, V, E, F, P, and N. Ugh. Okay. The vertex degree equation is exactly this one now. Right? The degree of the sum of the vertices is twice the edges. The degree was P, so there you go. And the face degree equation is this one, twice the number of edges is n times the number of uh, vertices. And we also have this one, right? the Euler formula. And essentially, what we will do now, we will put those three together and solve for the variables. That's essentially what we will do. So we know that the number of edges, number of faces, number of whatever equals two. Good. So if you, if you just use the two previous formulas to, re to solve for E, so E is, um, if you just put this over here, right? So E is, is this number. So V is just this number. I wanted to do it in the opposite way. Right? And f is just this number by just getting the n over here. And then you get this equation in E. 2 is whatever in E. Nothing really happened. I just replaced the symbols for the other equations. And I just rewrite that. Nothing really happens here. So um, there you go. Just rewritten algebra autopilot. So if you do it on paper, it's really simple. OK. Um, and this implies, well, this is just the same equation again, that we have um, this equation that 1 plus p plus 1 over n is a half plus some number. OK, a half plus some number, some, ed some number of edges. Well, it looks really innocent, but actually we're already there. Because this number on the right-hand side, that's why I arranged it, is clearly bigger than a half, right? I, I have a half, and I add some number of edges. So it's clearly bigger than a half. So we have this inequality, 1 plus p. So we have this inequality here. If you just ignore this part, this one, bigger to this one. And then you just solve. So if, if p and n are too big, then um, you just solve it. So there you go. You just solve it and just put it in a list. I will do that in a second. I will run that once, once more for you. So you just list them, p and n are just certain numbers, and if they get too big, you will, you will run out of this equation. Huh? Because, because this thing here needs to be bigger than a half. And here you're already at 8 over 15, which looks terribly close to a half. So as soon as you put a 6, this number will jump over to a, over a half. As soon as you put a 4 here, the number will jump over a half. So these are the only possible solutions that you just solve and you will find um, exactly the standard platonic solids. OK, let me run that once, once more for you. Um, essentially, we have three equations. right? So that's what the ones we discussed yesterday. And we kind of arrange them by trying to solve for the variables. We get an equation, which is an inequality. 1 over p plus 1 over n needs to be bigger than a half. And if p and n are too large, those numbers are too small, so they're not bigger than a half, and they can't work. So for p and n, there will be some break where this can't work anymore if they're both too small, uh, too large. It turns out, when you just list it, it turns out that 5 and 3 is kind of the biggest number you can, you, you can have as a pair. As one of them is 6, it's dead, and 4 and 4 is also dead. So you can just do the calculation 1 over 4 plus 1 over 4, that's spot on a half, and, but we want it to be a bigger than a half, so 4, 4 kind of drops out. And you then just solve the equation, and you get our, well, friends again. The complete list of platonic solids, and I just formulated in the theorem, 
is Bash. So we reproved our good share of 2,000 years of uh, mathematics development by essentially just using uh, the Euler characteristic formula. Right? So no other platonic solids. It's kind of interesting without playing around with any angles or anything. Okay, and I just did that. And the only thing we additionally need to do, so the first part of the proof is just a summary of what, what happened on the previous slides. And the only additional thing you need to do is you need to verify that these things actually exist. These are just not some random number coincidences, but um, I, hope, I hope everyone knows how they look like. If you play dice games, here they are. Um, I have a little bit of better picture if you don't like those. Oh, the tetrahedron. The, these guys are dual, the octahedron and the cube. And these guys are dual, um, the dodecahedron and the isocahedron. Fine. So let's go back. Hope that was reasonably clear. How do we do that? Okay, construction. Yeah, we play dice games. We're done. And we use this inequality here to rule out two big numbers. So you get a finite list. You just list them, and you're happy. And everything boils down to using the Euler characteristic formula. In case you're still not convinced that the formula is interesting, um, it, it's just really remarkable how powerful this, this little innocent looking formula actually is. Yeah. Here, proof of 2,000 years of mass history on, and it was a bit difficult, so maybe it was two and a half slides. For 2,000 years, I think that's, that's pretty okay. So here, here, there again. Whatever picture you prefer, this one is self dual. Remember that this one is self dual, and the other ones, ooh, that's not what I wanted. The other ones are dual to one another. Fine, let me get rid of this thing here. Cool. Well, there are also other polygon decompositions of the sphere. The soccer ball is one. Um, they're both kind of the same, but note that they're not platonic solids because the black ones are actually pentagons, they are five guns, and the white ones are always six guns. So that's not a platonic solid, it's just a different polygon decomposition of a sphere. Um, and this is just another picture, this is actually also a six gun, and just a slightly ar strangely arranged five gun, uh, if you want. They just push in a little bit the, the, the edges and make it look a little bit more fancy. Okay. Platonic soccer balls. So these are not platonic solids, but kind of polygon decompositions of a sphere. Cool. So, let's see. Okay, uh, let's do a soccer ball. A soccer ball is made out of gluing. Uh, let's do another soccer ball, not the ones from before. But let's try to construct a soccer ball out of triangles and octagons. Why not? Let's try to construct a soccer ball of triangles and octagons. And it's kind of fun that there's essentially only one way of doing that. And it again follows uh, from the Euler characteristic formula. Okay, so this is kind of the picture I have. I, I want to pave the soccer ball with uh, those little pictures. There's a, the, the octagon in the middle, and it's touching uh, those little triangles here. Whoop. And you run the same strategy. It's polygon decomposition of the sphere, so you have our favorite formula. Uh, where f is just the number of octagons plus the number of uh, triangles. And you just use the same equations again, do the same yoga, and you arrive with an answer, with exactly one answer. So if you want to build a soccer ball out of octagons, let's say you want to do that, you want to do it with octagons or triangles, there's only one way of doing it, um, with six octagons and eight triangles. So uh, what was my number? This was the triangles. So you need eight triangles and you need uh, red, six octagons. I'm not going through the details of the calculation. It's kind of the same idea as before. Uh, you can read it on the slide. We will have several examples, like in the, in the exercises of the same type. So you can essentially always, there's a unique way to construct a soccer ball, and it follows from the Euler characteristic formula, in case you're still not convinced that that formula is uh, fantastic. So you can do the same for the classical soccer ball, and you will find you, you, you can figure out yourself why they always look the same. There's a fixed number of hexagons, uh, sorry, of, of pentagons that you need to have 
That's why they always look the same, those, those soccer ball patterns. They're always the same. And it follows from the Euler characteristic formula. And I just, well, this is the answer that you get um, if you really want to construct a soccer ball out of octagons and triangles. So this little picture in the front, I hope that's reasonably visible here. So here, whoop, that was really bad. What happened to my cursor? So this little picture in the front is just the slightly bended version of the uh, local picture here, right? I just bend it, put it together into six and eight. So let's have a look. Six, well, it looks like a cube. So you have six octagons. And you have four in front from the triangles and four in the back of the triangles. And this is the only way of doing it. It's kind of, um, kind of interesting. And you get it if you want by just cutting off the edges of, of a cube. So if you take a cube, so here's, a, here's a cube. A really bad and ugly cube. But anyway, and I cut off the edges here um, so that I get loads of little pictures. So that's how you get them. And again, there's only one, for, one solution, and we can just check that by using the Euler characteristic formula. Cool. OK, so let's, um, let me summarize what we have seen. This is fabulous formula, which I need to pull up because it's just too good. Um, yeah. OK, so this is almost the formula. I don't want to click too much back. So it's 2 equals v minus e plus f. And I showed you three applications of that formula. And you can imagine that there are like a trillion more. So I really want you to like that formula. And the applications we have seen uh, were non-planarity of certain graphs. It's kind of a fantastic application. Looks like, looks like it should be completely unrelated. But there was non-planarity of, of graphs. We went through the platonic solids. And proved, formally proved, that they're using the same strategy as on the slide here, um, that there are only five platonic solids. And then you can play the kind of soccer ball games, and you can ask how many ways are there to, con to construct soccer balls. And it will essentially always, these equations will essentially always force one type of solution. It's kind of, kind of really, really amazing. So if you ever become a soccer ball designer, let me know uh, whether this is actually really useful in practice. Um, probably it is not, but who knows. OK, so Euler characteristic like, is really, really crucial. We have seen it for graphs. We have seen it for surfaces. And now for polygon decomposition in this sense. It's, it's, it's one of the key topics of, of the whole lecture. If you want one takeaway message, it's the Euler characteristic formula. And we will see it several times again. Uh, spoiler, spoiler. Cool. OK, we are ready to go to a new topic. Um, and this one is, is, again, very cute. I hope you will, will like it. And it's one of the most famous problems in mathematics altogether. And we're not going to solve it, because, well, famous problems tend to be really difficult. Um, but I'm going to show you how it looks like and how it works. And it, it's really, really amazingly cute. Yeah. So here was my octacube file. I'm asking the following question. Say I would give you a map of the world, like this one here. And I would like you to color the, the countries such that two neighboring colors don't, give, don't get, uh, they get different colors there. So neighboring countries, adjacent countries, whatever you want to call them, get different colors. OK. Um, and let's count the ocean as a country. So I give the ocean some color, like blue, and try to color the rest. So things that are completely not related to the ocean, like those countries here or this one here, they can be colored blue again, because they're not adjacent to the ocean. And then I would like to color the other, um, well, like Australia gets, or uh, what is it, yellow apparently, um, whatever. Russia is, is green or something like this. I want to color them in this way that you can really tell the, the different countries apart. So I do it, adjacent things get different colors. And the question is, how many colors do we actually need to do that? Does it depend on the map? Is there a fixed number of colors? Potentially, the number goes up to infinity, depending on the map. Right now, it seems to be difficult to see. Let me just list the colors we need here. I see blue. I see yellow. 
I see green, and I see red. And that's it. So I see four colors here. Right. Seems like if you color the, the countries of the Earth in this fashion, you need precisely four colors. Again, the ocean is a country, just to make it a bit, my life a bit easier here. Okay, how many colors do we need? It's one of the most famous problems in mathematics. And it turns out that there's an amazingly simple answer, uh, which I'm going to show you in a second. So you can make a guess now how many colors do you need. Um, and essentially, a map is just a polygon decomposition of, of a sphere, which hopefully is clear if I just draw this map here on the sphere. And every country is the face of that polygon decomposition. So essentially, the same idea as we used from before should apply here as well. Uh, it's just a kind of a different, a kind of different formulation of the same type of uh, problem. I'll make this more precise in a second. Can you please shut up? Um, okay, so let's do that. And the number, it's the number of colors you need has a fancy name. So jargon again is called, it's called the cr chromatic number. That gets a bit annoying. Let me close the door. Let's hope that works. Okay. No, not really, but anyway, so we go for it. Um, okay, so the problem is how many colors do we need? And we, we call the number of colorings, we need the chromatic number. That's what I just said. Okay, so let's do this. So we are looking at polygon decomposition, so I hope that's, that, uh, that yoga is clear by now. So here's a polygon decomposition. Let's do it completely in general of some surface S. We are mostly interested in the sphere, but let's do, let's do it general. And we call them adjacent if they say share an edge, so we, the countries share a border, right? So that's when they're adjacent. Um, and we let this funny number, this is a chromatic number. Uh, so P is my polygon deposition, my map. C is just coloring, and S is the surface, the minimal number of colors needed to color the polygons in exactly the fashion. Uh, from before, like the different countries get different colors. And the chromatic number is the maximal over all maps. Hope it makes some sense. For a given map, you have a certain number of colors you need, and the maximal number you need is called the chromatic number of the surface. Right? So I have different maps on my, on my surface of the Earth. You, you might want to color countries, you might want to color color uh, counties in England, that's how the problem originated. So in England has like trillions of counties and someone was forced to color them. Guess what, it was in something like the 18th century and, and they come, came up with this idea of, well, maybe there's a maximum number of colors that you need. So if I ever force you to color maps, you probably will come up with a conjecture yourself. Okay, but the chromatic number is just the maximum number of colors that we need. So what is that number? Right, that's essentially the question you want to ask. A priori it could be infinite because there are infinitely many polygon decompositions and they take a max of a set. So we'll see what that is. Okay. So for example, how can you compute that? So let's do the disk. So my little triangle here is a disk and I've drawn a map on the disk which needs two colors. So the number CP uh, for the disk, for that map, for that polygon decomposition would be two. Okay, here's another one on the disk. And now I need three colors because the, the middle face is touching like almost everything. So CP of the disk, uh, the next one here is three. And here's another one. I have a slightly nicer picture of that one. So it's kind of the same, but now a little bit a little bit nicer, it's the same picture. Now my middle country, and now it's really on the disk, is touching every, so everything is touching everything here. So we need four colors. Right? So everything touches everything. So we definitely need four colors. Next one is four. Well, it's the same picture, I just, 
it was just easier to do it in a, in a rectangle than in a circle. Oh, that's, that's why it is a rectangle. Okay, so it's at least four, right? We have found one, two, two, three, four, so it's at least four. And now you play around with this and you wonder whether there's five. So can, can you draw a map where you need five colors? Well, turns out for this map, which is already, well, too many slides, which is already reasonably complicated, four, four colors are enough, okay? So for this complicated map, four colors are enough. And you play around and you try to write down uh, various examples. So here's another one. Uh, you try to color them. Uh, write down maybe a sophisticated map trying to have as many countries touching one another as possible. And turns out you need four colors to do it. Interesting. And you play around, you try to find number five. You play around, you play around, you work very hard. Remember, a uh, story is that someone was forced to color the counties of England for no good reason known to me. Uh, but anyway, eventually you ask the question, what is the minimal number? You play around, it's four, it's four, it's four all the time, and you never seem to need five. So what, what is happening here? Maybe in this case the answer is four. Uh, right now it's not so clear how to do that. Right? Yeah. So we need at least four. I have, a, I have an example why we need four. But do we need five? Interesting question. And yeah. so we'll see. Kind of a little bit of a cliffhanger. We will answer that eventually. Okay. Um, let me just make that precise to make our game precise. So I want certain type of polygons. There will be a little bit of a restriction of the decompositions I allow, what is called a map, but they are mostly harmless. So we'll do that right here. So um, I, I don't want any country to touch itself. This is a bit obscure, so I don't want that. So no country, no region has a border with itself. Okay, I rule that out. Um, I, I don't, have, don't have any holes in my countries. Fine. It doesn't change really the coloring problem whether I have a hole in my country, but it makes my, my life a bit easier. Okay, my countries don't have holes. Fine. And countries are not enclosing other countries. That's kind of a strange condition because it's certainly true. So here's another story. So if you go back to too many slides, our friend here. So here, for example, there's this funny country that is red. It's called Lesotho. It's completely surrounded by South Africa. And it's like a little city on a, on, a, on a hill. And there's a lot of fun to visit. So it's just in the middle of South Africa. So we don't allow that. But that's really not a problem for our coloring because it's kind of only surrounded by one thing anyway. So we can kind of ignore it if you want. And it turns out to be technically easier to ignore those guys that are completely surrounded uh, by a country, but, but fine, right? So if we just think of it for a second, let's go back to this stupid. If we can color the map outside of this local picture, then we can also color the map with or without the little country. Fine. So the, the first two, I think, are kind of natural assumptions. No, no country is bordering itself. I don't have any real world example of that. Um, there are no holes in my countries. I think that's also fine. And the last one is just to make my life easier. It's, it's really not uh, that much of a, a restriction, but it rules out the Soto uh, kind of surrounded by South Africa. But anyway, I said again, if you can solve a coloring problem on the left side, you can solve it on the right side as well. And if you can solve it on the right side, you can solve it on the left side. So it's, it's really just making my life a bit easier. Okay. And same here. So if you have something like this, if you could solve the coloring problem on the left side, you could solve it on the right side. Okay. No thing has, has two borders. Fine. It's all just making my life a little bit easier. But essentially, you could think of a general map. Okay, fine. But it's just for convenience. Okay. Oh, again, if I can solve the problem on one side, it's easy to solve them on the other side. It will turn out to be. Otherwise, I would have a, a list of like a lot of cases I need to check, and now I can just make it a bit easier. So that's why I'm doing it. Okay, fine. I hope that's reasonably clear. Okay. Um, oop. Okay, and the basic idea, I just pull it up everything, is to use the usual formulas. And I have it again. So it's the same yoga. We have three formulas, and we want to use them um, to figure out what's going on. 
the average phase degree, what could that be? Well, we have the, uh, the average vertex degree is the same. Uh, we have the uh, phase degree formula and the vertex degree formula. So the average degree is just 2e over f or 2e over v. And we want to know that because the average degree gives us a bound on the number of colorings. The average phase degree gives us a bound on the number of colorings. Okay. And it's kind of in the Euler characteristic formula. Okay, fine. So these are just the equalities you get. Um, and just as an example, for the regular polygons, the average degree is the degree because everything has the same degree. But the average degree is really the average degree, right? So you can, if you have something of degree two and something of degree four, then the average degree is three. I hope that makes some sense. And we denote it by delta V or delta F. So jargon again, uh, delta V or delta F. This was really bad. Let me try again, delta F. All right, and those numbers are kind of important in the studying of our maps. And we mostly will explore that next time. I just show you already some, um, some spoilers for next time if you want. But the main problem is still, well, we'll show, see it again in a second. The main problem is still to, to find this coloring number, which a priori can be infinite, um, but it looks like it's not, because we kind of get, if, if you really try it, and you draw really large maps and try to color them, you will somehow always get stuck with four, so it's, it seems to be very impossible to find uh, number five. Cool. And the point is we have this lemma, which I'm just stating, uh, and I have written down a proof, but anyway, we will use that lemma. It's not, it, it's, so, okay, the terminology is when it's a lemma, it's not that exciting. It's just used somewhere. So fine, you don't need to remember that formula. But the point of this formula is we want to have this average phase degree because it's somewhat related to the coloring problem. We'll have something more explicit in a second. And you can write it in terms of the usual kind of uh, statistics you would write down for surfaces. The Euler characteristic, here it is, the, well, the number of faces and the average uh, vertex degree. Okay, that's all there is to it. And there's not much to be said. I mean, fine, the calculation does it, fine. Let's ignore it, not so important, because it essentially gives us the more important statement, there's a bound you can get from, uh, from that formula for this average phase degree. And the bound looks a little bit funny, but we will improve that bound as we go along. Okay, the bound is six times one minus two over number of f. Okay, that's what it is. Not that exciting for now. Um, we will beef up those statements. There's nothing you really need to remember. The point here is we play around with the Euler characteristic. You can see it already here. We play around with the Euler characteristic and get some bounce on the, on the things we are really interested in. Okay, fine. And I do that for you as well. Why? But the point is, what, if you can use those two lemmas, which you really don't need to remember, then we can say something about maps on S2, or funnily also on the projective plane, um, but ignore the projective plane for now, namely the average phase degree of a map on S2 smaller than six. Yeah, so you can never draw, you can never draw anything um, where the average phase degree would be six, for example. And maybe you already know that, so let's go back to my, too many slides, to my favorite example. <laughs> ah, here we go. Okay. The average phase degree, so this is a map kind of a strange map, but it is a polygon decomposition of a sphere. So it's a map on S2, and the average phase degree is lower than six. And yes, it is, because you have hexagons and pentagons. The pentagons will pull down the average phase degree lower than six. So you cannot build a, a, a what is it, a soccer ball out of, pentagon, uh, out of hexagons. Because if you just would build it out of hexagons, just hexagons, then the average phase degree would be six spot on. You can't do that. There's always some small phase involved, which kind of pulls down 
uh, sort of lowers the average phase degree. And this is really a good example, right? You can't do it just with hexagons. You need those pentagons, and that's exactly why those uh, patterns arise for soccer balls. So people probably tried eventually to build them out of simpler things, but this is kind of the simplest you can, because you need some small faces to pull down uh, the degree. Let's go back to many slides. Blop, 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 blop. Okay, fine, 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 all good. Boring lemma. Okay. So the average phase degree is at most six. Uh, sorry, it's strictly smaller than six. You always need some small phase in a polygon decomposition. I'm not going to do that. And that's why the platonic solids look like how they look like, because they are the ones, the, the things built out of small faces, right? The pentagon. Uh, squares and triangles. Yeah. So this formula is actually quite a f remarkable. So you can never build a soccer ball with only hexagons or bigger. There must be some small face in your soccer ball construction. Yeah. So it means there must be a face, a small face, right? Because the average degree is smaller than six, so there must be a face, which is at most the pentagon. And that essentially proves that five colors suffices. Yeah. So you never need more than um, four colors, uh, five colors, because of this easy equation. We'll do that next time formally, but essentially there will be always a face with not many neighbors because it's a small gone and you could kind of start coloring uh, from that phase onward and just then kind of keep the number of colors as low as possible. Okay, and let me just spoil the answer. I already did it. Um, so we will, uh, maybe the main proof I will give, it's a really amazing proof, um, is this five color theorem. So I'm on my last slide, so not doing today anymore. It's an amazing, fantastic proof. But actually, so let me spoil the story. Um, actually, the chromatic number of the sphere, so C of S2, will turn out to be 4. So we are not quite, and this one is, is like ultra famous. So here is um, a famous post stamp from um, the United States. So the story of this, this uh, the history of this problem, trying to find the minimal number of colors needed for usual maps, so not for something crazy like the projective planes, or really for the sphere, is like was stated like over 200 years ago, 150 years ago, something like this, and it took a long time to be proven. So it was proven finally in the 1970s, more than 130 years after it was stated, and uh, um, it was, was such a big breakthrough. It's one of the main crucial problems in mathematics that the, uh, the, the the, post, the American Post made an own post stamp, which essentially uh, summarizes the theorem, namely four colors suffice. You never need more than four colors to color a map. And I would really like to prove that theorem for you, but it's kind of out of the reach. Um, so there's a reason why it took 130 years to be proven. And it's one of the main, main examples of, like one of the main crucial examples in all of mathematics of a theorem, because it has kind of an easy type of statement that every map only needs four colors um, on a sphere. I remember my, my picture of the world only had what it was, blue, yellow, green, and red or something. Um, but it, it took a tremendous amount of work to prove it. And the only thing I can show you in this lecture is a, a little bit of a weaker version. I can show you that five colors are sufficient, which just follows from this simple observation that the average phase degree is kind of, you have some pentagon somewhere. Okay, but we need to do that next time because for today we already got. Uh, but this is one of the key open problems, kind of the key problems in mathematics. It's kind of really, really cute and simple and we're kind of trying to explore it as much as we can um, using the order characteristic. Thank you so much for coming.